I'm aiming to get through this at about half the time to save uh, some time at the end for like really specific questions. Um, a lot of this is going to be high level overview stuff. So at some point in the next six weeks or so, I'll do a Jira 201 class uh, where we talk a little bit more about some of the advanced stuff, JQL administration and stuff like that. But we'll start here just to make sure everybody's starting with a good um, f base understanding of Jira. Um, I've met most of you, but there's a couple new faces in the room. So uh, just to make sure everybody knows who I am, I'm uh, Dan Chuparkoff. This is my wife. Um, I lead marketing for the Jira family. So uh, that bridge is a big orange one over there. It's, you'll, it's foggy all the time anyway, so it never looks like this. Um, OK, so uh, also a little bit uh, something about me. Like, I, I, I track everything. Like, I spent the last 15 years or so really, really entrenched in the issue tracking space. Um, I use it at home. I use it at work. I've, before I was in Atlassian, I was looking, uh, to, looking for a replacement for my company for Microsoft Project for like eight years, and I tried about every uh, tracker on the market. Um, when I finally found Jira, I really, really liked it. It was really close to what I had been looking for for a long time. And uh, it was really, really hard to find, so I decided to come here and help tell the world what Jira is, right? So um, a, little, a little glimpse into my personality, right? So this is... <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner at my house in 2002. Uh, there's a project plan, like my aunt is assigned to something. My sister had a task here, which she had to do at exactly 3.58. Um, she was freaked out all day. She carried a clock around with her. It was, it was awesome. Uh, but we ate dinner at exactly 4 that day. And so like when I first, when I was having Thanksgiving like every year for my whole life, right? And every single time it would be like, 5 o'clock, 5.30, we said we were going to eat at 4. My mom has no idea what time she's going to be done. She's made the same exact food every year for like 52 years, right? How is she still not able to estimate when Thanksgiving dinner is going to be done? So at the same time, I was learning how to use Microsoft Project, and I was like, huh, I wonder if that would help. And so I, I actually made dinner this way for three years in a row, and it was, it was a cool exercise. Anyway, so I use Jira at home. This is my personal Jira instance. Uh, the stuff here is stuff that I'm, it's sort of like my to-do list, right? Like if somebody sends me an article like, hey, read this Mashable article, watch this TED, I put it in Jira. Um, I keep that, you know, mixed together with the stuff I'm doing for Atlassian. And so my goal is to make sure that my home stuff and my work stuff is both going up at the same rate. If I start to do too much Atlassian stuff and not enough home stuff, I, I, this graph helps me, helps me see that as a problem. All right. So um, we're going to talk about Jira 101 and how I've taken some of those deep rooted personal issues and apply them to my, <laughs> my job. Um, we're going to talk about some basic Agile stuff at first. Uh, then I'll go through Jira Agile planning and work boards and tracking. And then we'll talk about Jira issues and searching and dashboards and things like that. And what I'm not going to talk about in here is Jira administration. One, um, none of you guys are admins on EACJ, so you won't be able to do those things anyway. And two, uh, That'll be the next class. So. Cool. Uh, all right. So first, we'll we'll talk about some basic agile um, concepts. So, uh, in about 2000, uh, development teams were struggling with the same problem they've been struggling with for 20 years, and that was projects took way too long. Like back then, it was. You know, 18 months was a general software delivery project. And, you know, you would spend a year working on the requirements, and then you would start that 18-month development thing, and then you would finish it, and two and a half years had passed, and the thing that you set out to design was a little bit obsolete. So people were trying to create a, a method of reacting to change a little bit better 
planning in smaller doses instead of big, huge 18-month uh, batches. And so um, they invented Agile. And what they sort of discovered is with Agile uh, work management, not just software, in Agile task management, Agile relationships with people, um, better visibility uh, solved a lot of problems. Just writing down and posting the things people were working on it raised the visibility of what was going on. People prioritization decisions were a lot more clear. Um, so prioritization was one of the things that resulted from this. Um, less downtime between tasks was something also. It was before we had strong task management things, people would sort of work on something for a while and they would finish it. And then they would be like, ah. All right, what should I work on next? And they would sort of look at everything that was still outstanding, and they would figure out what the most important one was. And that, that downtime between tasks multiplies over time. So um, tracking systems help you make sure you're minimizing the time between actually doing work. Improved teamwork is another big uh, side effect of this. So when you put all of your team's work in one system and you're sort of self-assigning, grabbing work as it's needed from the top of the list, you get a lot better collaboration between people that all have the same goal. Um, and then finally, more predictability, right? If you start actually estimating the tasks you do, even if you're not a developer, um, estimating the work that you do and figuring out, can I really do these eight things by next Friday? Um, over time, as you try to do that over and over and over again, you start to get a really good understanding of what realistically you're going to have done by next week. Uh, so creating tasks. We'll start there. Um, outside of the development space, the thing people struggle with the most at first when they're trying to use JIRA is understanding what to put into JIRA as a task. So what is a task in the first place? Like doing a case study, making a promo video, doing some market research, those are some of the things that instinctively people will initially put in their JIRA. And then they start to realize, hey, I'm doing this case study, and it's not done. It's still in progress. It's been in progress for like 13 days now because I'm waiting on someone to review it. And so that's a task that sits in progress for a really, really long period of time, and that's bad. Making a promo video is another one of those things. Hey, we do the script, we get the customer signed up, we wait for the, you know, the video guys to come in, and so they're not going to be here for two and a half weeks. So again, that task sits open. Um, market research is another good one. We, have to, we do some specs first, and then we wait. Anytime you're waiting, um, that's generally, you can't wait in the middle of a task. You just do a task, right? So that's a, that's a sign that you're, you're probably talking about a collection of work and not just a single part. So my rule for finding that problem is this. So when you're defining tasks, always try to make sure they, they take more than 30 minutes to do. If it's just like, hey, go get my lunch from the you know, New York area, that's, that's too short to work or to write down. Um, if it's bigger than 30 minutes, though, it's probably worth recording because um, organizing those to make sure you're working on the right 30-minute things every day is probably a good idea. And then second, don't make a task that's more than three days. Personally, I don't do a task that's more than one day, right? Um, so that my stuff, so that I'm actually able to shuffle my prioritization every single day. Um, at first, aim for these two targets, and as you get better at estimating over time, you can tweak those uh, to suit your own needs. Um, so the second thing here that you will struggle with at first when you're trying to put stuff in JIRA is the thing I alluded to a second ago. So I have this write a blog task on my plate, and it's going to take me probably two weeks to do because I'm collecting information from a lot of people and I'm writing it, a draft and then I'm having my team review it and then I'm editing it and then I'm publishing it in WordPress. Like, that's not one task, that's a series of five tasks. Um, and so anytime you see yourself waiting on a task you think you started already, look at it closely and figure out if it's really a series of tasks, right? Because work should be binary, you're either in progress doing it, or, or it's done, or not started, right? That's the goal. Um, next, estimating is a really important part of this process. So as you are trying to figure out work, 
try to understand if it's a two hour thing or a five day thing, right? That's pretty important. So Jira uses the concept of story points and not hours. And so generally story points um, look something like this, where you don't go really, really super granular, do sort of a doubling effect. Some people use different numbers that are like primes and stuff like that. I do this because it's easier to frame in my head. Um, and as you're trying to figure out if your tasks are little tiny things or big huge things, Another thing I do is sort of story point cheating, which um, agile, agile, uh, uh, passionate agile people will yell at me for having this slide. But like, the smallest task I'll ever put in Jira is a 30 minute thing. So clearly that's got to be one story point, because that's the lowest I can go. And I sort of, do, three days is my limit, so 48 is my biggest number. And I sort of, every half hour is 30 minutes. And so as you're figuring stuff out, you know, your one hour tasks are two things and your one day things are 16 points. As you do that, you'll get really, really good at figuring out realistically how many of those things you're going to be able to do in a week, right? Because there's a very clear estimate translation. Okay, so the story, mm -hmm. Um, story point is an agile concept, yes. So what they tried to get away from is our estimates, right? Because as soon as you do our estimates and you put this task is going to take me two hours, but then you do time tracking of some kind and it, it takes you two and a half hours, somebody looks at that and says, hey, you're working too slow, right? So they tried to, tried to make an uh, obscure uh, number that was harder to translate so that when people were first doing estimating, it didn't turn into something that bosses looked at to judge performance, right? So it sh that's why it's deliberately obscured from ours. Right, 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 yeah. So there's, there's a bunch of different ways to do it, but like at first, as you're trying to figure it out, um, instinctively you're gonna be gravitating toward figuring out is that a half day thing or a full day thing, right? And so just have a number in your head that means half day and full day, right? Um, because that's the important part of this concept. And then if you're mixing work between your team, it's important that you're all using the same scale, right? Because if a half a day to you is eight story points and a half a day to, for him is 27 story points, then, you'll, then your team's work mixed together, velocity won't make sense, right? Okay. Uh, okay. So has everyone seen this screen so far? Like, has everyone created a JIRA issue at some point so far? Right. I won't spend a lot of time here, but there's a button at the very top of JIRA that says create issue. You get this screen when you do it, right? If there's a field that you want to type in that isn't there, you can click configure fields, and if it's one of these choices, you can add it to the screen. When you do that, everyone else on your team in your project will see that field as well, right? Uh, one more thing that's really important to sort of understand before we get into this is the difference between Scrum and Kanban. So Scrum and Kanban are uh, subsets of Agile. So they're two different types of Agile work. Um, and they, the difference is this. So Scrum, Scrum is used by teams that have a, a target deadline that they're trying to work toward. So it's a, a release that comes out. It's a client deliverable. It's um, something with a fixed date, and they're trying to manage toward it. Right? So the, the least important variable for a scrum team is the quantity of work that gets done. Date that it releases is generally more important than what's in it. Right? So a team that has a release coming out, JIRA 6.4, um, at some point they will have to make the decision, hey, this one thing is still broken. I either need to move that date or I need to take this broken thing out of the release. Right? And so scrum helps people manage that. Um, the batches of work that people do are called sprints, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a minute. Um, Kanban teams are uh, like Scrum teams, except that they don't have a target date that they're working toward. So support and service teams are generally teams that have a list of work that's always getting new items on it, and they prioritize it and work through it as fast as they can. Right? With a, with a service team, as they're looking at tickets, 
the, how many of those tickets are going to be done by next Friday is way less important than making sure they're in the right order and that team is working through them as fast as they can. So Kanban doesn't have a plan mode. So when you're in Jira Agile, you'll see this plan mode button is grayed out. You can't click it. You don't do planning for Kanban. You just prioritize and work as fast as you can. So your to-do list in a Kanban board just goes on and on forever, whereas in a Scrum, your to-do list is only the list of things you've decided to do in the sprint. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's actually show you some screens. So this is the plan mode of a Scrum project, right? So Kanban doesn't have a plan mode. This is the plan mode of a Scrum. This is my home instance. Right? So initially, you start creating issues, and you end up with a bunch of stuff in a backlog. Right? So you create a list of all the things your team wants to do. It doesn't have to be the list of stuff for now. It can be stuff you're not going to do for two years. Right? But you create all those tickets, and they end up in the backlog. The second thing that you need to do is figure out if you want to use epics. So these are epics. Right? An epic in Jira is more like a theme for that collection of work. Right? Um, the, the Agile team is working on making some changes to how that works so that it's a little bit more of a, um, a, a, a bucket that truly contains tasks. Right now, it's more like a tag. Right? So I have some things in my own instance. I have a, an epic called Books to Read. Right? So all of the books that I have on my list um, have the Books to Read epic. Right? So at any, any point in time, I could click books to read over here, and it will hide everything except that. So it gives me a, a quick way to visualize all the work of a, a certain theme, OK? Uh, exactly like a tag. Yes, exactly. Now, yes? Why are these not components? So components are, well, f the first answer is it's called Jira Agile. Epics needs to be in there somewhere. So we called it that, right? Um, <laughs> Structurally, under the covers, it's not that different from components, right? It's just another type of tag that you can put on an issue. The, the biggest difference is that with, because it's an epic, um, you can click these filters and see just the things for that particular theme. So, uh, OK, so once you have a task and you've put them in epics, then you start picking the things that you want to do next, and you drag them up here to the next sprint. So um, this is how prioritization works in uh, Scrum. So typically, your backlog is a big, long list with hundreds of things in it, right? Putting that huge, long list in order by priority is generally not that effective. But picking the things that you want to do in the next batch is really important. So um, grab the most important things, put them in the next sprint, you can actually start working ahead and bucketing your stuff in advance. So creating a new sprint in this list is as easy as clicking the Create Sprint button right, and giving it a name. Two-week sprints is a pretty good standard. Um, usually, one-week sprint is too fast. You're starting and stopping sprints so often that the administration is not worth it. Um, so two weeks is a pretty good number. One month or six weeks uh, is a little bit too long, too, because what starts to happen is if your sprint is six weeks long and you get some new request for new work that has to be done right now, um, you're adding new stuff to your sprints all the time. So two weeks is a good place to start, and you may tweak that. Yes? How do you handle dependencies? Um, so de so f first, uh, you can link tasks with, uh, together in JIRA. So this particular task here can be linked to this other task. right? But this system doesn't enforce that that other thing is done first. Like People have to self-manage the dependencies. JIRA will indicate that there is a dependency, but it doesn't help you make sure those things are all done first before you start. So I can drag something up in the sprint before something else that is dependent. Correct. And, and actually, also, by dependency, I, I'll say JIRA allows you to link two issues. But JIRA doesn't know if you mean this one has to be done first and this one second, or vice versa. Right? It just knows that those two are related. There's going to be a warning. Right. 
Right. Uh, let's see. So I've dragged stuff up. Um, the other thing about two-week issue, uh, two-week sprints, is that in a year, right? There are 26 two-week sprints, and that's exactly how many letters of the alphabet there are. So it's really, really uh, convenient for me to use letters for my sprints, right? So that when we're talking about which sprint we should do things in, everyone is on the same page about whether we're talking about sprint H or sprint I. Um, that's really handy if you're thinking of names for your sprints. Yes? What's is the typical way of doing it? Do you create your epics first, think of it top down or bottom up? I generally create my epics first. So I create my epics first because that's the thing that tells me what kind of stuff I should be doing. Right? So I know I want to be, uh, so at work my epics are something like, you know, do stuff to support the experts. Um, do stuff for email, make changes to whack, um, things like that, right? So I, I make those first, and then I figure out, okay, we're going to do email stuff. What, what do we need to do for email stuff next? And that helps me, the epic first helps me figure out where to put my energy. If I create tasks first, right, I'll think of an infinite amount of things I want to do to whack. Um, and Will fill, that'll fill my whole entire plate, and I'll never get to expert things, right? So I do expert stuff first to make sure my work is evenly balanced where I want it, OK? Uh, let's see. So um, once you start a sprint, you, you click Start Sprint by clicking Start at the bottom. And I've already started this one here. And once you have an active sprint, you start working in work mode. So work mode looks like this. You have columns, right? Um, I won't spend a lot of time on how this works because it's pretty intuitive. You just drag um, from left to right. You can go back if you decide, hey, I was working on this, but I actually stopped. You can pull it back over. Um, pretty intuitive. When you click um, the, the project name, you will see the detail for that task in a little pane that pops up over here on the right. Um, and now the question that some people have next, once they start getting in here, is they say, OK, well, to do in progress and done is nice, but I have a review stage for the work that I do. right? Or I have you know, two teams that are working together, like a dev team and a QA team. So I do you know, some work, and then I pass it over to the next guy. And then he does some work, and then he passes it back to me. Um, that's workflow inside of Jira. So um, you can have this can, workflow is infinitely complex, right? We have a customer in Massachusetts working affiliated with MIT, and they're doing genetic testing using workflow. They have like literally 8,000 columns in their workflow. They can't display it in a board like this, but under the covers, they literally have 8,000 steps for each of the decoding genome parts of the process. Right? So you can make this as complex as you want. I will caution you, however, all the work that you do should follow the same workflow. Right? So this is to do in progress done, because anything that I could possibly imagine doing fits into that workflow. Right? As soon as I have some things that say, like for books, right? books that might be think of the book I want, get it from Amazon, read it, tell people about it, right? Like that, it could be that. But um, as soon as I have some other thing, like watch some YouTube TED, right? Then it doesn't fit into that workflow. And I need to manage two boards. And as soon as I have two boards and four boards and six boards, then there's no one place I can go to look for all the work that I have to do, right? So don't get too crazy with how many workflow steps you want. Yes. Right. So I, my personal belief on that is that's always two tasks, right? I, I, I prepare the draft of the road trip deck for Jay, right? And then I have a second task that says, you know, incorporate Jay's feedback into the road trip deck, right? That will always be two tasks for me. The waiting is, right, because I, I don't know how long the waiting will be. I, I can't work on the thing until I get it back. I'm not actually managing that other person's uh, time of waiting, right, the review. So like all those things, really, I, I do the draft. And then I, I have the, 
the accommodate the, the feedback task highest on the list in the next batch. So as soon as I get that feedback, I can start on the second half of that. So I never have a waiting step. But I mean, like with blogs here, like we, when we manage our blogs in EHCJ, we do put a review step in there. So it, it's possible to do it. I, I typically don't, because I'm not in control of the people that I'm waiting for. And my number one priority is I don't want to have things in my in progress column that I'm not actually actively working on. Uh, yes. So, there are all the tasks that are managed in this one board, or the tasks you showed us a couple screens ago. So, you know, realistically, you have things like a roadshow or a summit. There are going to be you know, lots of subtasks that don't necessarily. Well, I guess maybe they do. But right. You know, it's more than get a book and read it. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. So, um, so those are so the do the you know prepare for the road trip is a collection of tasks. I could give those a particular epic, right? So like the epic that I use in, in real life is the, you know, our, we have Atlassian events. I have an Atlassian events epic and I have a non-Atlassian events epic, right? So when I just, when I click the, the Atlassian events epic, I'm gonna see all of my road trip tasks in that view. I'll see the ones that I'm actually working on at the top. I'll see the ones that I'm, I haven't started yet further down the list. Um, I might start seeing summit tasks at some point, right? But, but they're really in the same list, and I should look at them together usually. If having them all mixed together is confusing, then I would create two epics to help me separate those. So in this particular view, I'm really only concerned about the things I'm supposed to be doing by next Friday and the things I'm actively doing right now. Um, and then the other thing is, at the very top, there's quick filters. So you can see, uh, I can't see, um, only, only my issues are recently updated. You can, uh, you can create additional quick filters that show you things of a particular type, right? Uh, and on this scrum board, mm -hmm. you, pick, you, you got multiple epics, say so you have 10 epics, and you may pull up to a particular sprint from five different epics, you know, mixing your Yes, absolutely. Um, almost always, and actually what I'm attempting really is to make sure that with each sprint I'm advancing all of my epics a little bit, right, in, in my particular context, right. In a developer's world, they might want to focus on one epic, knock it all the way out, and then move on to the next one, right. But in, in my, my context, I'm trying to evenly distribute my work across all the channels I need to support, right. Um, OK. Uh, so the next I'll talk about burn down. I think like burn down is really probably the most important graph or uh, thing people will, would look at in JIRA. So burn down really, once you've, once you've created a bunch of tasks and you've put them in a sprint, right, and you've started that sprint, then your, your goal is to take all those things in that sprint and get them done by the end of that sprint. So in our case, a sprint is two weeks. Right? And at the beginning um, of the sprint, our team collectively, the four of us, created 600 story points worth of work. Okay? So that 600 story points worth of work divided by four of us is telling us there's about 150 points each that we're trying to do. And I know from our team's velocity that we generally only do 120 each. So we probably failed at the very first day of the sprint already, right? And you can see that we're proving that that's true because this line is our actual progress and this line is what we should be achieving, right? So in the next two days, we still have to finish 500 story points worth of work and um, these guys are screwing around here, not doing any work at all. <laughs> um, so this is the burn down. What you're really looking for here is nice even downgrade so that you're accomplishing things over time. Um, what you will see when you first start doing this is you'll see a start and then you'll see lots of up, right? An, an up line slope means you started your sprint and then you added more things to it, right? When you add more things to your sprint, your ability to finish what you thought you were going to finish starts going down. So when you add something to a sprint, ideally you should take something out 
right? Because if you don't, you're either not going to finish what you thought you were going to finish, or you're going to be working on the weekend. Both of those are normal occurrences, but, um, but that's what the upline means, right? Um, the second thing that you're going to see is you're going to see a bunch of horizontal like this, right? And then you're going to see that at, at 1.30, after these guys get out of this meeting, they're going to go back and close all the tasks that they forgot to update, right? And then I'm going to see a big cliff, right? And, that's, and those are the two things that you'll see in burn down. Um, if you have the opportunity, display this on a TV near your team and make sure that everybody is, is watching this graph over time. Making it, it really helps make your team estimate better. It helps you figure out what you're going to accomplish by the time frame you think you're going to accomplish it in. And none of this is about you know, making promises to our, you know, our GM about what we're going to finish. Right? This is about getting better at estimating what we think we're going to accomplish. Right? Yes? Right. Um, but we don't have a systematic way of recording how long it actually took. Right. So two, th two things about that. First, uh, that happens to everybody, right, when, they're s when they start estimating at first. Like in your past, you probably never, ever had to estimate the things that you did. Um, so you you're probably suck at estimating at first. That's why story points is more useful than hours, right, because it doesn't matter if you think a story point, it, it, or that uh, four story points is two hours. What really matters is that you finish 50 story points a week, right? Whether, whether you think that's, um, you know, 100 hours or, or 40 hours doesn't matter. You can look at this graph over time after your sprints, and we can see, okay, wait, you guys are only doing 50 points each. You think you're going to do 80 points each. So each time you start a new sprint, you should lower the number that you're starting with. It doesn't actually matter if, you, if your task takes the right amount of time. What really matters is that your total amount of story points is a number that matches what you've delivered in the past. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, Cor correct, and so so that that variability is is always part of this. Definitely, what what's generally true is that the amount of easy things and the amount of hard things in your plate is on your plate is fairly consistent over time, right? You know, that it'll waffle back and forth, but when you after you do you know a year's worth of sprint estimation, when you look back at a year and see that your average velocity velocity is the number of story points you can do in a sprint, right? After looking at it for a year, you'll be able to see pretty clearly that you get about the same number of points done every time. Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Do we have, uh, I don't know, at some point you can build a library of primitives because you know that if you're doing A, every time it's going to take two story points. So when I'm putting A as a task, then I know it's going to take two story points. Um, there's not a way to do that here, although you can clone an issue. Um, but that's finding the old issue to clone is probably more uh, effort than, than it's worth. Um, generally, what happens is people over time start to say, OK, when I do a blog, that's probably realistically 16 points. right? And they just know that, that and you just start, rem you just get better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so uh, those are those happen for sure, right? And so the reason that the reason that I only get you know a hundred story points done in two weeks is because you know I'm doing a lot of other stuff besides the stuff that's on this list. And so those interruptions, um, when they're when they're consistent over time those interruptions will be truly reflected in your velocity, right? What's bad is when, you know, over a course of a month, right before Summit, right, people go up to Rudy, like, every four minutes, right, and ask him questions. But then, like, three weeks after Summit is over, right, he goes through a period where he's in more control of his time, right? And so Rudy's ability to estimate his interruptions 
is, is hard, right? And a lot of us have those same sort of roller coaster uh, interruption patterns. Um, but really, there's nothing in JIRA that will help you manage that. JIRA and most Agile trackers are assuming that whatever the variables are in your workday, whether it's easy stuff to estimate and hard stuff to estimate, easy things to do and hard stuff to do, interruptions, the time of day you work, how many weekends you do, like, most Agile trackers are assuming that all of those variables are just constant across a year worth of time, right? So when you do a bunch of estimation as best as you can, and then look at the total velocity that you accomplished, it's probably pretty close to true, right? So that when you're planning your upcoming things, look at how much you accomplished in the past and try to, try to plan according to those things, right? So the next thing I was going to show you is JIRA issues and dashboards. So once you have work in JIRA, um, looking at that work in dashboards is, aside from the work that you're actually doing, so day to day you're usually looking at work mode, Right, you're looking at the tasks you're trying to do. You're moving the tasks closer to done. If you're, con if you're interested in what your team activity is, if you're interested in the work other people are doing, um, JIRA dashboards helps you do that. Right? Um, this is a basic JIRA, JIRA dashboard. Uh, you can drag and drop these sections around. You can uh, add new things to the list. There's a gallery of things you can add. Um, the, uh, this is my home one again, and so uh, you can see this is sort of focused on things I'm doing for home, things I'm doing for work, um, and then quick access to the, to the lists that I go to often. Uh, if what you're looking for isn't there, what you'll generally want to rely on next is searching for issues. So if you click the uh, issues, we can't see the top menu, but it says issues. If you click that, the first thing on the list is search for issues. And if you click that, once you click search for issues, then you end up with a screen that looks like this. Right? There's two ways of searching for stuff in JIRA. The first way is called basic search. And if you have basic search enabled, and that'll be the default, you end up with drop down boxes here at the top. You just pick a project, um, you pick status, and you can pick just by checking check boxes. There's also a more link somewhere. Um, over there, and when you click more, everything that's in your JIRA instance is a choice, right? So if it was on the create issue screen as something you can put in, then it will be in that filter drop-down box. So creating a collection of issues to look at is, is pretty easy with basic search. As you get more complex, you'll want to maybe switch to um, what we call JQL. So JQL in our vocabulary is JIRA query language. And typing it is pretty easy. You just start typing and it will give you suggestions. So up here I typed project. And right after I typed project, I got a list that looked like this. And I could pick equals from it. And then as soon as I hit space after equals, it gave me a list of the projects that were choices. Right? And so you can sort of start typing and it will suggest whatever your possible choices are. So it's really, really easy to start creating a query um, that gives you a complex list of issues. You can combine different projects together like this. You can look at everything that lots of people are doing. You can just look at your stuff. I could just look at Jake's stuff, like whatever, whatever you want. And so this is how search works. So all the gadgets on the dashboard use search. All of the quick filters on your Agile boards use search. So go to issues and search for issues and play around with that search mechanism a little bit because you'll see when you go to try to do other things on work boards or with workflow, you'll see that those um, that you'll need to know how to do JQL either in basic form or advanced. And that's searching, that's work mode, that's plan mode, that's creating issues, that's Pretty much it, but now I can do questions, as many as you want. Is there a model that you can That's a great question. So uh, we, last May, we released the HTML5 version of JIRA Mobile. So there's no app. Um, it's just, it just works in a browser on your phone. So if you go to EACJ on your phone and log in just like you would at your desk, you will get 
a simplified version of the interface. Um, it's designed to show you um, uh, the things that are active for you, so you can look at your list and see what's in, what's in progress, what's important, what's critical. Um, and then the second thing that it's designed for is when you're at your on your phone away from the office and somebody tags you in a ticket, you get an email and that has a link and you click it. We wanted to make sure the thing that you got when you clicked the link in an email was readable. That's its real job. That's it. Yes. Um, I know in conference you have you can create tasks and assign them to people. Has yeah. anyone thought about how those tasks kind of relate to the issues that you see? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, in the beginning of February or late January, um, Confluence 5.2 came out. 5.4, right. Um, so there was a project which we codenamed Coat Hanger, right? And Coat Hanger, one of the features of Coat Hanger is to take a list of tasks in Confluence. If you select the text and right click it, you get a little JIRA icon and it will suck it into JIRA. Um, automatically, and it's pretty cool. So oh, the d the design, and this is pretty important from a uh, an Atlassian messaging perspective, right? Our design is that a team will collaborate on requirements together as a team in Confluence, right? They'll take an idea and turn it into something that has um, fleshed out specifics. At some point in that process that list of requirements turns into a list of things you want to do. And so in Confluence, you end up with a list. You suck that list into JIRA automatically. It creates the list of things inside an epic right, in JIRA. And then you assign that work in JIRA. And then using the create branch link inside of JIRA, you can immediately create linked source code right, to the issues in JIRA, which are linked to the requirements document in Confluence. So end to end from concept to launch with very few clicks, um, those integrations work. So, All right, uh, that's, that's it. But like, as you guys get started and start playing around, uh, definitely come find me if you have any questions. Um, and that's it. Thanks for coming, guys.